Proximal hamstring tendinopathy presents as pain on the bottom side of the glute, which is where the hamstring attaches onto the pelvis. In this video, we'll talk about four things that you should know about proximal hamstring tendinopathy. When looking at the treatment of proximal hamstring tendinopathy, strengthening exercises are the primary approach, and there's a lot of different variables that we should consider here. When looking at the actual structure of a rehab program, it typically goes in three different phases. We have an isometric phase, an isotonic phase, and then plyometric or return to sport. An isometric exercise is an exercise where the muscle contracts, but the joint actually doesn't move. And this can be a great starting place for those with proximal hamstring tendinopathy because it allows us to control the range of motion that we're loading in, as well as the amount of load that we're loading the tendon. For example, with a long lever bridge, the closer our feet are towards our glutes, the more glute activation we're going to get. And then as we bring the legs further out, the more hamstring we're going to load into. As well with this exercise, we're able to keep the hips in neutral, and so we're not loading into flexion, which is typically a provocative position. Generally, when performing isometric exercises, we wanna to try to hold for 30 to 45 seconds and then repeat for three to five repetitions. Although the tolerance of the tissues is going to vary between individuals, so we might start off with less either duration of holds or less reps, depending on what the tendon is able to tolerate. In isotonic exercise is what we normally think of when we think about strengthening a muscle. When the muscle contracts, the joint is now going to move. And if tolerated, we can start with these isotonic exercises and just skip over the isometric exercises. Typically isometric exercises are better if there's a really sensitive tendon to certain positions or if it just can't tolerate much load. But if tolerated, we actually wanna start with isotonic loading and this is where majority of the focus of the rehab program is going to be. And there are two main areas of focus for isotonic loading. The first is that we want to gradually increase the tolerance to load of the tendon. So we wanna gradually increase the weight that we're using for these exercises. The second part is that we wanna increase the range of motion. Initially, we might not be able to load too much in a flexion because the hip might be a little bit too irritable. And so as we progress through the exercises, we wanna gradually expose the tendon to more flexion or just gradually more range of motion. Additionally, we wanna make sure that the tendon is able to adapt to the loads. So we wanna perform these slowly, something that we call time under tension. So we wanna make sure through each muscle contraction, we're doing it over three to four seconds. So each rep is actually over six to eight seconds, it's a long time but that'll make sure that the tendon is able to sense the load and adapt to it. There are two different approaches for isotonic loading and it really depends on the tolerance to load. So because the hamstrings cross both the knee and the hip joint, we can actually move either or, or both of them for that matter, as we start isotonic loading. So if the tendon is quite sensitive to load, we might actually start by loading at the knee. So doing a standing knee flexion exercise or knee curl, that way we're able to keep the hip more in a neutral position and eliminate a little bit more irritation at the proximal hamstring. The other approach is to move at the hip and this is probably the more direct route because when we look at what irritates the proximal hamstring, it's typically hip flexion. So sitting, lunges, and squats are all activities that typically irritate that proximal hamstring tendon. And so if we're able to actually load at the hip a little bit more directly, then we're able to build up that tolerance to hip flexion a little bit more quickly. And regardless of the approach, we wanna make sure that we're loading the tendon adequately to make sure it adapts to those loads. So again, we wanna perform these slowly over six to eight seconds. So it's three to four seconds in the concentric phase and then three to four seconds in the eccentric phase. A majority of rehab programs recommend three sets of 15 reps. So that also is really going to depend on the tolerance. So start with whatever is most tolerable and then gradually build up from there. Finally, plyometric exercises are quick loading movements to prepare the tendon for return to sport. And our selection of these exercises really depends on what the demands of the sport are. For example, if we look at running, we're not loading the hip through a large range of motion. What we're actually doing is doing a bunch of quick jumping movements. So an exercise that we might do for proximal hamstring tendinopathy would be something like a pogo, where we're doing some smaller hops to prepare the tendon for those loads. Whereas if we look at something like soccer, for example, then we're doing a lot of quick sprinting and a lot of cutting movements. So our exercises might include skipping and then also some lateral shuffles to prepare the tendon for those demands. When starting plyometric exercises, it's important to know that the tendon typically takes around 72 hours to recover after each plyometric session. So initially when we're starting a rehab program, we probably wanna only integrate these once every three days to make sure that the tendon has enough time to recover between each session. There's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to stretching and proximal hamstring tendinopathy. The common recommendation is to avoid stretching because what happens is that it leads to compressive load of the tendon against that ischial tuberosity.
And so things like stretching, which involves hip flexion, are typically going to be provocative movements. But it's important to know that stretching and compressive loading isn't necessarily damaging to the tendon. The original research was compressive loads plus tensile loads would lead to structural changes to the tendon. And so when we think about compressive loading, compressive loading is where the load is perpendicular to the tendon. So this would be the ischial tuberosity pushing into the proximal hamstring tendon. Whereas tensile loading is what we normally think of when we think about tendons, where the load is through the actual tendon itself. And so when we think about stretching, it might be moderate to high levels of compression, but the tensile load is actually pretty low. So the total load on the tendon isn't sufficient to cause structural changes to the tendon. Of course, it's okay to temporarily limit the amount of compressive loading with hip flexion because it's going to be irritating for the tendon. But in the rehab program, we wanna make sure that we have a plan to reintroduce compressive loads. And that's because a lot of movements like sitting, squatting, and lunging all require those compressive loads. So we need to build up the tolerance to compressive loads. An approach to gradually expose the tendon to more compressive loads could look something like a quadruped rock and then going into some tall kneeling and then finally into a standing hamstring stretch with each one of those gradually increasing the tendon more to compressive loading. Imaging for proximal hamstring tendinopathy can be a little bit tricky. On one hand, it could be useful to see the tendon structure and then also be able to rule out other diagnosis. But then on the other hand, the structural changes to the tendon don't always correlate with pain, which can be a little bit misleading. The structural changes that we see are referred to as tendinosis. And in those without pain, we see these structural changes in about 65% of the population. So this gives us some insight into how much the tendon has been loaded and then the response to that load but it doesn't give us much insight into pain, meaning that if we have these structural changes, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to correlate with the intensity of pain or even the presence of pain. While we might still think, well, it would be good to still get an image just so we can see what's going on, there are some problems with unnecessary imaging. Things like increased surgical interventions, poorer outcomes, transitioning from acute to chronic pain, and decreased confidence are all things that have been linked to unnecessary imaging. And so we want to make sure when somebody's presenting with proximal hamstring tendinopathy that we're doing a thorough exam and history to make sure that we know do we need imaging or do we not need imaging because that might change how we approach the treatment. But just getting an x-ray or an MRI just because is usually discouraged when we look at what the evidence suggests. This video is mainly focused on the structure of the proximal hamstring and then loading strategies. But one thing that is becoming a bigger factor in tendinopathies is actually metabolic factors. Things like increased blood glucose and high cholesterol can increase the risk of developing a tendinopathy and can impact the tendon's function. So of course our rehab program wants to make sure that we're focusing on a loading strategy, but we can't ignore these other factors, especially with more chronic presentations where we're not responding to a loading strategy, these metabolic factors can actually be the thing that's being the barrier. These metabolic factors can also influence our rehab exercise approach. So generally when we think about proximal hamstring tendinopathy rehab, the focus is on the tendon, but more general exercises can actually help with these metabolic factors, which can then help with proximal hamstring tendinopathy. So maybe it's swimming, dancing, or something like that where we're getting a little bit of exercise in can address some of those metabolic factors, which can actually help with the recovery process. So when we're looking at treatment of proximal hamstring tendinopathy, we wanna make sure that we're focused obviously on the tendon, but we're not losing sight of the person as a whole in their health. So hopefully these four things on proximal hamstring tendinopathy were helpful. If you wanna learn more about proximal hamstring tendinopathy, there's a bunch of videos over here. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button over here as well. And then if you have questions or comments, leave them down below. I'll see you in the next video.